Welcome to Bronze and Modern Gods. You know what that logo means. It's time for us to get together again. I am John. And I'm Richard. And today we have part three of our interview with Chuck Rosansky, the founder and president of Mile High Comics. Lots of interesting things today uh, he's going to be talking about. You will be surprised about the succession plan for Mile High and what Chuck is up to lately. We also have our underrated books of the week, a fun one for the 25 year rule. But Richard, let's get started with our hot book of the week. This is all you, so I'm just going <laughs> yeah. to take the wheel. Go for it. Uh, this is, it's a Star Wars book. Uh, yeah, shocker. Uh, Star Wars Darth Maul number two. It's the first appearance of Cad Bane. Cad Bane is a bounty hunter in the Star Wars extended universe. Uh, he specializes in fighting Jedi. This is an interesting thing. He fought Obi-Wan and he fought Anakin during the Clone Wars. He wears a mask. And if you see him in, in, uh, uh, in the latest episode of Boba Fett, which has basically been taken over by the Mandalorian, um, he shows up in, in, a, in, a, in a classic spaghetti western kind of uh, standoff. He's got this blue face. It's actually a mask, and he has these tubes coming out of his neck. Uh, he wears a mask because he has a tube inserted down, down his throat specifically to pre prevent Jedis from being able to force choke him, <laughs> which is it's a pretty... That's going down the long pipe to make sure that your enemy can't hurt you that way. Kind of, kind of by, uh, an easy fix, uh, if not if uncomfortable. But. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's, you know, he, he was in the uh, uh, he was in the Clone Wars TV show uh, and had a, had a, 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 a good role in there. And it's, he's, he's a He's a fan favorite. He's a favorite of people who are who are uh, fans of that extended universe, which is now becoming the canon universe. Um, this book is his first appear his first appearance. He's not on the cover. He's on the cover of issue three, which is also having a big spike. But this book, people have been speculating on it for a while. You know, there's a number of key Star Wars characters that everyone thinks is going to show up in uh, the universe. This is one of those characters. His book, uh, this book was selling for high about $500 back in December. So it wasn't necessarily an inexpensive book. But ever since the news, ever since he appeared in that episode of Boba Fett, uh, his book has just been on, been on fire. There was a high sale on eBay for $822 of this book. Wow. There's a, keep an eye out. There is a second print of this book. Uh, it's a low print run. A second print 9.8 went for eleven hundred dollars. <laughs> uh, and it is even more. There is there are multiple covers for this book. There is a one in twenty five Aja cover, which is the big ticket item, and it's going for over two thousand. So it's 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 a hot book. It's a hot character, and I think uh, the Star Wars extended universe is just going to be. Uh, a hunting ground now for characters that people are going to think are going to show up in uh, the uh, in canon in either in this series by this series I mean the Boba Fett series or the Obi Wan series which is coming up uh, soon and then the Ahsoka show Just so many opportunities for new characters to show up if, if they show up in in canon. You know, there there's low print runs on these runs, and yeah. so that means if you've got these books, uh, you can you, you can really get a good payday. I guess. All right. Well, be on the lookout for that one if you can uh, get lucky and find it in a dollar bin. I don't think you will. But uh, <laughs> stranger things have happened. Uh, it's no surprise who our guest is today for our main topic. It is the founder and president of Mile High Comics, Chuck Rosansky in part three of our wide-ranging interview. This is the conclusion, the pulse-pounding conclusion. Here's your way you'll find out what Chuck is up to these days, and the answer may surprise you. So here is part three of our interview. So let's roll that beautiful bean footage. I'm the last man standing mm -hmm. from that entire generation. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of joy in that because so many of my friends, people in the industry that I really knew and liked and, and I can even say loved, you know, people like Jack Kirby and Julie Schwartz and Harlan Ellison and, you know, people that, that I, I, they were my contemporaries. I grew up with them and, and, and I looked up to them and their genius and uh, they're all gone now. And that really 
oftentimes makes me feel very bittersweet about things because yes, I've survived. Yes, I'm the last man standing, but that isn't necessarily joyful. So you, you have to find your joy in doing things like imprinting positive memories into impressionable young people mm -hmm. who otherwise might have had a really terrible day that day. But thanks to an institution that you built and created and, and, and visualized, um, you've made their day and maybe even some small part of their life better. You know, when this store is gone and it, and it is an exercise in my madness. So I don't think that my kids have no interest in continuing this store. Mm -hmm. So in all probability, it will disappear when I disappear. Um, it's a moment in time. I tell people it's like a beautiful flower. Appreciate it, savor it. Um, but don't think that it lasts forever because nothing lasts forever. As you had talked about, you had a certain feeling when you saw when you when you saw that uh, heard about that first collection. Did you sure. have that same kind of feeling with the Mile High Two collection? Was it the instantaneous, you know, uh, realization yeah, of I, an opportunity? I did, but the trouble with the Mile High Two collection was that I was really kind of blackmailed into buying that deal, and I really didn't want to. Um, you know, it. I had. I bought. I bought out Richard Alps' mail order collection. Mm -hmm mail order business. And uh, Alf was the one that told me that ads selling actual comic books listed in Marvel produced huge results. He had done a test with a little two inch ad where he had listed about six titles and said, you know, you can buy uh, Daredevil, you know, 50 through 75 for a dollar each. And, and he just had like six different titles listed there. And he took in $2,000 off of an ad like this big. Wow. And uh, he said, Chuck, he said, you could, you could really run with this. And uh, that one idea was the one that I really pushed with uh, Marvel when I went there in 79. And so I, that, that all went good. The other thing that Alf tried to get me involved in, though, was affidavit returns. He had this guy in uh, Brooklyn by the name of Heine who had a warehouse that he never had to lock. <laughs> wow. In Brooklyn. <laughs> That's we have big Think dogs. <laughs> okay, and he told me that Jaime had so many comics in there that they they used forklifts and they would they would move the pallets around so that they could get some new pallets up into the front row so you could dig through them and then they'd bring you another pallet and then another pallet and then another pallet. Well, anyway, um, there are those out there who believe that Jaime's warehouse was the only warehouse, and it was not. Um, I got approached by people out of Baltimore, people out of Boston. I had all kinds of people who wanted to sell me affidavit returns. And I was like, no, they're stolen comics. I don't want anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I get a call from a guy that I had done book business with. Well, little, little did I know, but they also had affidavit books. And uh, they were the property of his dad. And uh, they were in deep financial trouble for a whole bunch of different reasons, some of which were greatly deserved. The old man was in Attica. And uh, they don't send nice old Jewish men to Attica without a damn good reason. And I'm not going to expound on what that reason was. I'm just going to say it was a damn good reason. And uh, it killed him. He, he died within, yeah. definitely within a year, I think within about nine months of finally being released. But anyway, his son wanted to sell me his comics, and his comics were theoretically personal property, not property of the company, which is good because the company was, Jesus. I mean, when you, when you go to a guy's place, and the first thing you see is the shell of a burned-out delivery truck. Oh. <laughs> good omen. <laughs> and you say, what happened there? And he says, oh, yeah, we had a little problem with the Teamsters. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> it's like, ooh, this is getting interesting mm -hmm. fast. Anyway, um, I managed to walk through about 86 different minefields in order to buy that deal. There were 1.6 million comics and about 200,000 Warren magazines in the deal. They were all pre-1983. Um, I went to my friend Mike Hobson, who was working with Shooter at the time at Marvel. I went to Mike Hobson at Marvel and I said, Michael, I said, uh, these guys want me to buy this deal. And I said, 
I think they're all affidavit returns. They sure look like affidavit returns. There's a few of them that have that blue ink on them, but the vast majority of them are like in sealed cases, and they have the name of the distributors on now, them. Now, can you say and, affidavit returns are returns that came back from a particular dealer that are supposed to be destroyed? Is that They were supposed to have been destroyed, and an affidavit was signed and sent mm -hmm. to the publisher that said, we ordered 800 of these from you. We sold 200. 600 of them were sent off to the landfill. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, landfill service. Exactly. Yeah. We haul them, we dump them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, like I said, Jaime was just one. This was... <laughs> Well, what did Hobson say when you said you suspected they were affidavit returns? He said, I don't want to know. He said, there's no way that we can trace these books. Mm -hmm. And really, at the end of the day, we don't want to. We want nothing to do with this. You, I said, well, then I'm going to buy them. Yeah. He said, you go ahead and buy them. And the reason why I wanted to buy them, wanted, needed to buy them, was because of the guy who called me. He wanted a quarter each for these comics. I said, you're out of your mind. That's that's an immense amount of money. I don't have half a million dollars. He said, well, you got to come look at them. Well, I did. I flew out there and I looked at them. He said, here's the deal. He said, if you don't buy these, the only other offer I have is from Jaime. And Jaime's going to give me a nickel. Oh, jeez. I said, you got to beat a nickel. I said, well, I could beat a nickel. Because what I had done, they... they they had their big warehouse that the Teamsters had wrecked. You should have seen the inside of it. Oh, my God. They accidentally took forklifts and knocked over five high pallet racking. Oops. Boy, they, it was, it, it, this was really crazy time. Okay. I've done some crazy deals. This one was really crazy. But anyway, um, they had all the comics in this mini storage unit, but in mini is a misnomer because it had one big corner unit that was about 3,000 square feet. You don't see like many storage units with 3,000 square foot spaces, but mm -hmm. they, they had one. And this thing was pallets, okay? Not pallets with aisles, pallets up against each other all the way through the entire thing. When you when you rolled up that, that freight door, there were pallets right up against the door. You so, write in your column about this, a really harrowing example of how you had to physically walk on top of oh, all yeah. comics. Yeah, yeah. And then I did like Uncle Scrooge, and I burrowed into him like a gopher, <laughs> okay? Because that's what I had to do. I had no other choice, okay? So I, I, I went to a pallet, and I started just taking boxes, setting them up to the side, I'd step inside the pallet hole and then keep lifting boxes out and kept going down because... By yourself, by yourself, I should point out. Pardon me? By yourself, I should point out. Oh, yeah, and it was brick. It was February, and it, uh. it was like 10 degrees. This is in New York, and I'm doing this with a flashlight. This is at night. This was, oh, my God, this was, this was crazy pants. But I'm burrowing into this pallet. And I get about halfway down and I hit X-Men annual number once. Wow. An entire layer of X-Men annual number ones. And it's wow. like, I think I can pay more than a nickel. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I can do this. And I hit some other 12 cent marbles. But the important part is um, uh, my friend Denny, who I, who I got the money from for uh, uh, the church deal. Denny um, was a computer programmer who his specialty was analyzing core drills from ore bodies. So if you're down in Southern Arizona and you got a, a body of copper underneath a mountain, you take drills and you, you take cores. And if you take like 50 cores on a grid, then you can analyze those cores and you can get a pretty good sense of how much copper yield you're gonna get out of that. Well, I took Denny's theory and applied it to comic books. I started doing core <laughs> drills, going down into these pallets. And as I was hitting 12 cent marbles and like the 25 cent X-Men annual number ones, which by the way, I ended up with 2000 of them, oh, wow. um, or maybe three. Um, 
anyway, it, 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 it rapidly became evident that, that this was a deal that I wanted to do. And so I started talking to the guy and he said, yeah, he said, you know, if you don't buy these, he said, I'm going to sell them to the five largest dealers on the East Coast. And he said, I'll have to break it up and I'll get my money slower. But he said, I'm not going to sell them behind me because the guy's screwed. And he said, um, if you don't want to pay a quarter, come up with a number. And so I went back to my banker and I had a $40,000 credit limit with the banker. And I, I went to him and I said, hi, I'd like $100,000 in cashier's checks, please. And that was an engaging conversation. Long story short, I got the hundred grand. Right. I did because um, the way that it worked out was that Jaime was going to pay them $90,000, 1.8 times a nickel, 90 mm -hmm. grand. So I went back there with a hundred grand, which topped Jaime's by 10 grand. And I said, I will also give you a promissory note over two years for 140 grand. That's 14 cents a unit. I said, I've run the numbers eight ways to Sunday. That's the best I'll do. These guys were not exactly stellar citizens. Uh -oh. So at one point, I was taken to a lawyer's office in Manhattan and shown a wall of what were called corporate books. So there'd be a book that would have your um, filings from when you started a corporation. And a lot of times it'd have your little notary seal inside the book. But they were books. And every corporation has one. I still have one for my life. They took me into this, this lawyer's office and they showed me this wall of corporate books and they said, every one of those is a corporation that we started and bankrupted oh, and geez. screwed people. Oh. They said, how do we know you're not going to screw us the same way? And I said, because I'm Chuck Russell has mile high comics. I'm not going to screw you. And they said, so, OK, we'll do this if we can put a life insurance policy on you for the 140 grand. I said, oh, hell no, you're not. Mm -mm. And uh, this was a conversation that went on for a week. I wouldn't I wouldn't budge. I was not going to let them put put a life insurance policy on me. And finally, I'm having a discussion with the guy's son in a hojo. <laughs> and, and the guy the guy asks me one more time, Chuck, this is the only thing that's keeping us from closing this deal. Why won't you do this? And I said, well, because then you'd have every incentive to kill me. Right. <laughs> right. On the stairs. This is in a whole joke. <laughs> the room went dead silent. It was the damnedest thing. I had no idea anybody heard me, but they did. And, uh, but, you know, Hojo's in Long Island. That wasn't the first time they heard Yeah, I'm sure not. Um, so, <laughs> Daily occurrence. Yeah. So anyway, um, finally, I got to this guy because um, let's just say that he had some recreational habits and that his wife was had deeper recreational habits. Like she was calling us every 10 minutes. You guys have a deal yet? Have you made a deal yet? You know, I'm really not feeling very well. Have you guys made a deal yet? I'm, I, I'm just not feeling good. Have you made a deal yet? It was the 80s. <laughs> so it's Friday. My flight home is on Saturday. It's 4.45. We go to a coffee shop. The guy says, I just can't do it. I said, your dad's getting out of prison on Monday. Your power of attorney expires. I said, how about this? And I reached into my pocket and I had brought with me cash. I had $100,000 in cashier's checks that were locked in the vault at my motel. But I had brought cash so because I didn't even have a credit card in those days. So I needed to pay for everything cash. And I'd been very careful with my money. So I brought $5,000, but I still had 2,500 or something left over after a week of putzing around there. I pulled out 
$2,100 bills. And I laid them out on the table in this coffee shop. And I said, that's your commission if we close this deal today. I said, if we don't close this deal today, they're going home with me because I'm leaving tomorrow morning. I said, but I've got five trucks waiting for my phone call and they can be here tomorrow morning. So we can do one of two things. <laughs> I can go to the airport tomorrow morning or we can be loading trucks tomorrow morning. Your choice. And he slid the $2,100 bills <laughs> off of the table and said, let's find a notary. <laughs> And we found a real estate agent that hadn't closed down yet, a real estate office. And at 5.30 on a Friday afternoon, she's like, ka-chunk. And, and that was the deal. And uh, he then disappeared. And uh, I went to his house to pick up the, there were, he had the John Byrne X-Men that he had, he had pulled out. So it wasn't that he was ignorant about comics. He knew comics mm -hmm. to some extent. Mm -hmm. He just didn't know them really well. But he knew John Byrne X-Men. So he had the John Bird X-Men in a room at his house. Well, when I got to his house, half of them were already gone. I knew uh -huh. this, this piece of, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But when he opened the door, his face looked like it was covered in talcum powder. <laughs> it was the 80s. <laughs> it was like two $2,000 worth of talcum powder. <laughs> and his wife wasn't sick anymore. She was so happy to see me. And it was just a really good thing that we'd made the deal. She knew it would work out. She was so happy. And by the way, do you want to go to Limelight tonight with us, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Um, I still was mucho paranoid. So um, we had a deal, which is that we loaded my five trucks, which we did. I hired some, some guys and a forklift, and we loaded my five trucks. And I had my trucker call me after they crossed the George Washington Bridge and hit New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Why? Because their book company owed huge taxes to the state of New York. Now, it would have been the perfect scam for those jackasses mm. to have pulled on me, mm -hmm. to have taken my money, taken my promissory note, and then let me get my, seize, my stuff seized before it exited the state. Right. So, the deal that I had was, you get the $100,000 in cashier's checks, when I hear my stuff is across the state line. <laughs> Smart. Okay. People think that I got Mile High Comics and kept Mile High Comics through dumb luck. No, boys and girls. There was some luck involved. And I am very grateful to Providence for the opportunities that are presented to me and for the good fortune that I've been blessed with. But, man, I've done a lot of things on my own, by my big own self, to survive that other people might not have thought of. Mm -hmm. And uh, even then, even then, like I said earlier, there are at least 20 times when things just didn't turn my way, when, when I made what I thought was a good decision turned out to be a terrible decision, and where people have stolen from me, and where um, I've had my bank fold. Man, if you ever want to go through a nightmare, have your financial institution go bankrupt. Oh. That is a bad place to be. Um, I learned that the hard way. Um, but the key thing, and, and you alluded to this earlier, is, is to always have a vision, always have a belief in yourself, always think in terms of alternative pathways in case one closes, always have sort of a fallback position. And then I guess the greatest thing, and this is something that you really have to remember, when I've had some of my worst travails, I've had people like Steve Jeppy at Diamond step up and help me. It is the relationships, the trust. Mike Hobson could have said, oh, no, you can't buy those books. We, we have a financial interest in that. No, Mike Hobson liked me. Mike Hobson didn't give a shit. Mike Hobson, just, just go buy them, whatever. We don't care. But guys like Jim Shooter, you know, I, I had one time where... 
uh, Jack Kirby was supposed to come sign for me and had a stroke a week before. And I had put all my advertising out. And I called up Stan. And I said, Stan, I'm screwed. Jack can't show up. I need, I need a headliner. He said, I'll be there. He said, you got to pay my airfare. But he said, I'll waive my gratuity, my, my, my fee. He came for nothing. It's, it's your network. It's your network. And it's, it's the relationships you make. It yeah, really but you got to earn that. I mean, right. you have to be willing also. If somebody else needs help, you got to help them. And if you can do something good in a given day, even if it's if there's no immediate reward or recompense, or always try every day to do something good for somebody. And you know, I'm not. I don't want to be preachy about things like karma, but I think that that karma does have some measure. It, I I call it providence and and positive energy. Put positive energy out in the world, and you're gonna get some that 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 reflects back on you. And that's what you got to do: is always try to do something good every day. I didn't have to come in today and sit all day sorting comics and trying to make my website better. Or but if things went to hell in a handbasket, <laughs> maybe that would that's just one little more little bit of insurance, one more little bit of of mm -hmm. insulation from the vagaries of fate. Because, I mean, fate is crazy, the caprice of what can happen on any given day. You know, you're sitting there taking your daughter to school and suddenly the, the, the World Trade Center is falling down. Right, right. How do you plan for that? And the answer is you plan for it by having reserves, by being cautious, by maintaining strong relationships, always keeping your word, always being trustworthy. You know, and the, John McPhee wrote a series of books, and one of them that I really like is called Giving Good Weight. You know, uh, one of my staff members drives me crazy because she overgrades books. And uh, the rationalization that I have is that, yes, I might charge somebody more than they want to pay on a near mint, but when they get it, it's going to be nice. And if, and if they get a fine from me, it's probably a very fine because Pam is always overgrading shit. It drives me crazy. But, <laughs> but we're giving good weight. We're giving good value. You know, it's that whole baker's dozen thing. If somebody orders 12, give them 13. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, through all of these decades, decades now, it's hard for me to fathom just how primitive things were when we were first starting. But... Um, you know, I didn't even have a phone in the first store because God. I didn't have any monies. Well, um, I think some of the good you're doing now is uh, also within the store. You have, and people probably are not aware of this unless they've watched your tour video on YouTube. You have created a safe space for uh, trans or gender questioning youth. And you're even having drag shows in the store. Correct. Yeah, that's because we couldn't find any place else to do them because um, drag youth in particular are uh, precluded from being in uh, nightclubs and bars right. uh, after a certain period of time, even with their parents. And uh, performing would would really transgress those, those lines. And uh, so the clubs could lose their liquor licenses. Oh, wow. So finding a place that was large enough and that was also willing to let trans and gender questioning youth and their straight siblings. We don't really give a shit. I mean, anybody who wants to perform in our shows, we let them perform. And uh, we have kids that do drag. We have kids that do essentially karaoke, um, where they're um, doing interpretations of songs, where they're, they're, they're singing live. Um, we have kids that do um, interpretive dance. We have kids that do poetry. And, uh, you know, by at least some segment of the community, we get pilloried um, for um, ostensibly being pedophiles and encouraging um, uh, both deviance and uh, uh, Satanism. I mean, it's the whole the whole QAnon crap that you hear out there. We've had proud boys in jackboots outside the building threatening to kill me. And, uh, yeah, that's just the way it is. How, how, I don't know how these people sleep at night, but be that as it may, I can see differences of opinion. I can see where, you know, we live in a free society where people should be able to do what they want to do. But I ask for that same protection. Okay. I want to allow kids who do have questions about gender 
to be able to explore that in a safe place, and I provide that here at Mile High Comics. I've lost at least 10,000 customers because of that. I've had people who have said they will never, ever buy from me again. Um, I typically get one or two or three trolls a week now still that, that uh, uh, jam on me, and I don't mind. Um, bothers me not in the least. Remember what I said about the five millions earlier? <laughs> I don't care. I'm still going to have a net worth over $20 million tomorrow. No matter how many mean things you say about me, I'm going to feel really, really right. not so bad. Meet no, me in the $20 million not. club and we'll talk. Yeah. 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 Well, I, love the, I love the expression decamillionaire. Like, you know, <laughs> bitch, I don't care. And, uh, you know, the fact that I personally perform in drag and that I identify as being gender fluid, um, that also just rankles the hell out of people. And, uh, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, but you, know? you have to, as a comic book podcast, you have to share with everyone your drag name. Oh, my, my drag name, which, by the way, came about with zero forethought. Um, I was going to perform on stage and I was told, you got to have a drag name. And I said, okay, call me Betty Pages. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, you know, awesome. I put the S on the end because I didn't want to call myself Betty Page because that's ludicrous. I'm a guy in a dress. Um, that's, that's, that, that would be stupid. Okay. But Betty but Pages Betty is Pages, so apropos. <laughs> yeah. Betty Pages is just sort of a, a, a you know, a way of, of uh, kind of complimenting her for the unbelievable um, vivaciousness and and uh, girl next door sexuality mm -hmm. that she mm -hmm. was able to exude for so many years, and uh, I'm a huge Betty Page fan. So, oh. um, you know, I I would never do anything that would that would take away from her memory. Uh, that, that's not my goal at all. Um, but it seemed like a good name, and it, it's much better than, you know, like I you know, and I'll I'll give you the name of. There's a group in San Francisco called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, and of um, I know I know quite a few of them, and they are really rude. Okay, but uh, <laughs> well, one of my best friends is any is excellent fundraisers for the community. Oh my God, yeah, they do so many good things. But one of my best friends from the Imperial Court Council is Annie Cockle Do, um, and uh, you know. Uh, I didn't want a name like that, okay? Because I'm, I'm not a sister of perpetual indulgence. I, I perform um, uh, what's called um, glamour drag. So, yeah, you're uh, a pageant girl. Yeah, uh, kind of pageant, but really, I'm more Rita Hayworth, 1947, oh, sort Hollywood. of the old Hollywood torch kind of yeah. um, drag, and it's a style that works for me, um, and it. I've performed practically every state in the union, um, uh, at least blue states. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd be shocked at some of these red states. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. We just opened up a, uh, well, I guess they're sort of purple. Um, we just opened up a chapter of the Imperial court in uh, Georgia. So we, we have one there. We opened one in Florida about five years ago. Um, not too many yet in South Carolina or North Carolina, uh, but we got one in D.C. But anyway, um, I performed from Florida to Alaska and San Francisco to New York. So, um, you know, I, I I don't it's one of those things that was not a part of my life prior to um, my having contracted a, a severe brain uh, injury. Um, but it's a super important part of my life now. And. I don't know it you know having lived entirely as a straight person for a long period of time and then becoming a part of the lgbt community in my mid-50s it's a very different experience than most people have gone through most people have you know as they've approached puberty their their sexual identity has been um has been defined my my changes came about much much later in life and uh you know, that's a podcast in and of itself. <laughs> but suffice it to say that uh, uh, if I had people who weren't too fond of me before I came out, boy, howdy, did I throw some gasoline on that fire. And, you, uh, you, you find out who your friends are. I mean, Richard was there when I came out and stuck by me and, and you know, has been a good friend for 30 plus years. Uh, oh, going on 40, Jesus. Yeah, 40. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I think... 
probably the most important question here at the end, we're going to wrap this up, is who are you betting on for RuPaul's Drag Race season 14? <laughs> I was waiting for that question. I don't watch RuPaul's Drag Race <laughs> because it's, <laughs> listen to me, there's a reason, okay? I don't like mean girl shows. Oh. Mm -hmm. I don't like mean girls. I don't like the whole premise of competition. Um, when my when my daughters were in their teens, they loved America's Top Model, yes. and that whole kind of competition that was going on there. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched that. some RuPaul. I go to I go to a lot of uh, uh, drag bars, and uh, a lot of times they'll have a, an evening where they'll be showing, and I I find the performances fun and and um i actually know some of the queens uh, we've had some queens here in denver that have won and uh, so i know them and uh, you know it's all well and good but at the end of the day it's all about trying to supersede other people and that um, is antithetical to my way of viewing the world i'm uh you know it, all of, all of my aggression comes out in in buying and selling and dealing i'm a i'm 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 you know i'm a capitalist and mm -hmm. so i'm always involved in transactions and doing things and and that's where i channel all of that kind of energy once i leave that behind um what i want to do with my drag is to really try and move the needle in positive directions and raise money for charity and to try and do good things, encourage youth, help them out, provide them with a safe space. But the idea of seeing people in conflict and backstabbing each other, mm -hmm. I've unfortunately had to live with that myself. And it's been, I've had enough of it. I, I don't, I just, I can't abide it. You, it makes total sense. And it also is a lesson that not, not one size does not fit all. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. You know, uh, so I think we're going to let you go because we're going on two hours. And I, I want to thank you so much. Thank you. Spent so much time with us today. Sure. And I'm happy, happy to help any time. Um, as you can tell, I've got a lot of stories. Oh, um, they're awesome I know stories. <laughs> I know where a lot of bodies are. Um, and uh, I'm not reticent to talk about the past at all. And there's only one flavor of me. I mean, I, I come across exactly... The same way with my family and with everybody else, I, I I learned a long time ago that I'm just a really, really, really terrible liar. I can't, I can't do it. Um, and so the best way to be is to be incredibly forthright and um, really just sort of speak what I think the truth is. And that's not to say that I'm always right. I mean, there's a lot of times that I'm wrong. Maybe I misremember things or sometimes... Um, there's just positions that I take that turn out to be wrong. That, like I said, I, I'm, I'm a guy who almost went bankrupt 20 times. I had to have his friends bail him out. Um, but I'm still here. And, and that nobody is else is. A great lesson for all of us to probably take with us going forward. So Chuck Rosansky, thank you very much. If you guys want to read some of Chuck's excellent, excellent writings, uh, I will link to them in the description below along with a link to his YouTube video for Mile High Comics, where you can see a tour of the Superstore, the warehouse. He gives you a behind-the-scenes look, plus an exclusive four-part interview with Jim Shooter that is a must-watch for anybody that is a fan of this podcast. Chuck, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I want to leave everybody with this one admonition. Figure out a way to do something good today or tomorrow or the day after just do something good that has absolutely no benefit or reward for you, but which makes our world a better place. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, there you go, Richard. Uh, learning things uh, about Chuck and Mile High and what the future holds and more importantly, how to be happy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's, uh, it was a great interview. I'm so glad we had an opportunity to talk to him. Exactly. All right. It is time for probably the second lamest transition ever into <laughs> the 25 year rule. I don't know. I just don't have the energy today. I'm <laughs> trying, but this is a good one. 25 year rule. We go back to 1997 and Scooby-Doo number one, Richard. 
Not the first Scooby-Doo, right? No, this would be the first DC Comics issue for Scooby and the gang after a short Archie comic series earlier in the 90s. Now that Warner Media had bought the rights to the Hanna-Barbera uh, collection from Turner Broadcasting, they actually bought Turner Broadcasting, it made sense to bring the franchise in-house to DC Comics. This was the first issue of a long Scooby-Doo run that lasted 159 issues all wow. in 2010. Yeah, but it didn't end in 2010. It was just relaunched with another number one, and they're still going today. Um, if the original Gold Key Comics Scooby-Doo number one that Richard referred to is too far out of your reach, which it is for most people, it's a super scarce book. I 4.0s go for about a thousand bucks on a good day. Right. This may be a good alternative. Uh, there's not a lot of these around, especially in high grade. I think the only thing holding this one back from being more expensive is it's just an awful cover. It's it's really <laughs> focused on the monster. It's not really focused on Scooby and the gang. If it had a better cover, uh, this might be getting a little more love. Yeah, you know, the, the the cover for the Gold Key was just so iconic. Just, you know, the, the characters front and center. I'm surprised DC didn't take the cheap route, route and just make a homage to that original cover. Yeah, I mean, it's everything you want. It's Scooby jumping up, you know, like and Shaggy being scared. <laughs> right. So this one is like, uh, OK, uh, great. All right. Uh, I, I'm just going to start looking for this, too. I want this and I want a copy of Darkwing Duck number one. I don't know why. <laughs> I can't explain. All right, let's move on to our underrated books of the week, Richard. Again with the Star Wars. Yeah, you know this this whole uh, this whole uh, you know rating the extended universe thing um, has had me thinking. And uh, there is a, a book specifically Star Wars Darth Vader number nineteen from the twenty eighteen series. You got to kind of you know preface which series because uh, they keep rebooting these things. Yeah. Um, this is the first appearance of Trilla Sudari, uh, who is the second sister. And uh, the, the sisters are, uh, there are these inquisitors, which are basically Jedi hunters that are, that are uh, force sensitive. They wield lightsabers. Um, they are some nasty folk. And uh, they, they are specifically out there hunting Jedis. Uh, so the second sister, she uh, is... She shows up a number of times in this in the Star Wars, Star Wars um, mythos. Uh, specifically, she is searching for the main character of the Star Wars Fallen Order game, uh, and who we think we may be seeing uh, in a, in an upcoming episode. God darn it! I forget the dude's name, and I forgot to put it in my notes. Dude, uh, dude. dude Star Wars, dude. Yeah. That's if you haven't played the game, the game is excellent, um, and I'm surprised I can't remember. Uh, this book is, is her first appearance. There's some um, argument with Fallen Order, uh, uh, Dark Temple number five being her first appearance. I, I, I'm going by Wikipedia, which I, I feel is kind of the uh, the final final thing. Wait a second. Wikipedia. Yes. I have to stop you there for a minute. <laughs> Wikipedia. Okay, Wikipedia. Uh, so the Star Wars Fallen Order game, Cal Kestis is uh, the, he's a Padawan, uh, a survivor, a survivor of Order 66. And uh, we, you know, the feeling is he's going to show up in the Obi-Wan show. And if he shows up in the Obi-Wan show, there's a chance that we're going to see uh, the second sister as well. Uh, so there's people are specking on this book, and but it's a it's a completely spec buy. Uh, but so was the Cad Bane that we just talked about earlier uh, in the show. You, you just really you really don't know unless you're in the the pocket of, of the producers of of the Star Wars franchise right now. You really don't know who they are going to pull in. Insider trading. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, right now, rods for this book are about sixty bucks. Uh, you can get uh, there's a nine point eight sale for 175 so it's still affordable is it going to reach you know the eleven hundred dollars of the second print for the cad bait first appearance i i i doubt it but if you buy in at 60 bucks and it sells for 500 let's say that's 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 a pretty hefty uh, uh, you know uh, increase on uh, on your investment so How something to think about you have 
<laughs> I, I, you know what? I, I have um, not specced on this character, to be honest with you. I, I, I did spec pretty hard in Ahsoka Tano, uh, when, when, she, when uh, before she came out. So I was happy about that. But you know, it's just, it's so flexible. There's so many characters, and with the ongoing uh, Star Wars Republic. Uh, series, uh, uh, High Republic series that's going right now. They're just they're just cranking out new characters. It seems like every issue, and uh, you know it's it's difficult to, to out of all of that you know chaff to find the the wheat. It's a lot to keep up with. Well, that's why I keep things simple with my underrated book of the week. <laughs> it is Tales of Suspense number seventy. What's special about this book? No first appearances. No major character arc. It is believe it or not. The first solo Captain America cover since 1955. Wow. Yeah. Uh, after Cap's three issue run in 1955 with the Atlas Hero revival, Cap was not solo featured on a cover until 10 years later in 1965, right here. Before this, Cap was sharing the cover in Tales of Suspense with Iron Man because it was a split book. They would cut the cover in half, and Cap would be on one side and Iron Man on the other. This cover's great. You've got Cap. You've got Nazis. You've got a swastika. You've got Bucky in bondage. <laughs> uh, there are just two 9.8s in the census. Wow. Pacific Coast pedigree, which I would love to have. There's also a 9.6 Pacific Coast pedigree. A 9.0 of, oh, of this book is a little more affordable. It runs you about 225 bucks. I have been on the hunt for this book in high grade for a while. It's surprisingly tough to secure a high grade copy raw. So I think I'm going to have to bite the bullet and buy a slab because, you know, it's for me, it's significant. It, it, CGC doesn't note it on the label. I think if you are a cap collector, it, this will mean something to you. Uh, but Tales of Suspense 70, just uh, another milestone in Captain America history. Yeah, I, I am really surprised you don't have this, uh, you know, it's being, being the cap fan that you are. Oh, I got I've got like a rag. <laughs> uh, reader, but I don't mm. have it super high grade. So gotcha. It's time. That Tales of Suspense run from like 65 to 99, those bopped around in discount bins forever because nobody wanted them. You know, it was a lower tier Marvel Silver Age title for the longest time. Iron Man was a C list character, believe it or not. I know people mm -hmm. like to argue that in the 70s, Iron Man was bi monthly at one point. Sales mm. was low. So. Uh, and Cap, you know, was not doing much better. Uh, there was a point in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, they were even thinking about canceling Captain America. Wow. Uh, I know. Uh, but Jim Shooter came along, uh, improved the storytelling across the line, helped save Cap and Iron Man. And here we are today. All right. That is going to wrap it up for our Monday episode. Everybody, thanks for joining us. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bronze and Modern Gods. Like this video, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell. Thank you, and see you later, Richard. See you, John. Everybody stay safe. <laughs>